everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar on keys to anaerobic digester stability. I'm Dan McKeaton. I'm a research and development chemist at Aquafix. I also handle a lot of our educational programs. So I work with Aquafix Laboratories. Uh, we're a service laboratory. We also do a lot of work with research and development. So we handle a lot of different customer samples that come into our lab. We do a lot of microscopy. We've started to branch more into anaerobic testing like metals analysis. Hopefully in the next year or two, we'll be starting to do BMP analysis as well. If you have any questions about our services, please let us know. We also do a lot of consultation work and sometimes we pick up little research products for unusual customer problems that come up. So yeah, if you have any questions for our labs, reach out for us and we'll attempt to address them. So today we're gonna to be covering a few things here you can see. We're gonna start with some basics on anaerobic digesters and some symptoms of digester health. Then we're gonna talk a little bit about causes of poor digester health, preventing upsets and use of Aquafix products in order to do so. We'll also talk about managing upsets if they can't be prevented because not everything can be prevented in anaerobic digesters, though you can dramatically reduce the amount of upsets your site will experience through effective preventative measures. All right, so starting with the anaerobic digester basics. So anaerobic digestion is a process which takes place in four or five steps in some cases, depending on who you ask. The first one is disintegration, which is a critical step to anaerobic digestion, but it's not focused on very much in literature because it's pretty simple. Disintegration is the breaking up of large solids into small fine particles which have a greater amount of surface area, which makes it easier for things like methanogens or acetogens to consume the substrates present. After things have been disintegrated into fine particles, bacteria in anaerobic digesters produce something called exoenzymes in order to hydrolyze the fine particles into a form which is soluble and can be consumed by bacteria. Um, after that, we have acetogenesis and acetogenesis, which are sometimes considered separate steps and are sometimes considered the same. I usually lump them together for simplicity. Uh, it's also important to note that they sound so similar that sometimes when I'm giving a pre presentation, people will get confused by which I'm talking about. So we're gonna stick those together as one category for today, uh, where you're taking volatile acids and other organic substances present, and you're converting them gradually into acetic acid or acetate. And the final step in anaerobic digestion is methanogenesis, where methanogens are primarily using acetate, but also using carbon dioxide and hydrogen in order to produce methane. So the keys for disintegration to take place, which is a pretty big rate limiter in many anaerobic digesters, particularly lagoons, you need to have agitation. You need to have some water movement. Otherwise, the large solid chunks are not going to break into smaller solid chunks. After that, you need a healthy acid generating bacterial population in order to begin to consume these chunks. It'll produce the exoenzymes, it'll break down long chain fatty acids into short chain fatty acids and spit them out so that the methanogens are able to use them to produce methane. Now in these three steps, agitation and methane generating bacteria or archaea are more likely to be a limiting step than the acid generators in anaerobic digestion. There are exceptions to this, but a lot of the time the acid generating bacteria have a very healthy diverse population that can handle a lot more environmental shifts. But things like agitation, if you have large chunks entering into your system, those can take a very long time to degrade purely by not having adequate surface area for exoenzymes to work efficiently. And methanogens tend to be less diverse and grow very slowly, which often makes them susceptible to problems in anaerobic digesters. So just talking about a couple advantages and disadvantages, and we'll contrast them loosely, uh, anaerobic to aerobic digesters. Anaerobic digesters have a number of benefits. They require less energy input most of the time. In an anaerobic digester, the main need for energy would be heating the digester. They have a fairly large volume. They need to be really well insulated. And heating and maintaining a warm temperature in a large volume of solids takes a lot of energy. Fortunately, if an anaerobic digester is being run efficiently, methane produced is very effective at heating digesters. It can just be burned on site to heat a boiler. You can recirculate uh, liquids from the digester through the heater, and you can maintain a really high temperature without using much energy, as opposed to an aerobic digester, where no matter what, you're going to need to use electricity to run an aerator. Uh, in fact, in some larger plants, like uh, the local plant here, the Madison Wastewater Plant, 
they generate a large portion of their plant's electricity through anaerobic digestion most of the time. It's not a perfectly stable power source, but they are able to leverage anaerobic digestion to save energy rather than cost energy on site, which is a big reason to use anaerobic digestion. Another thing is anaerobic digestion tends to do a better job at reducing solids than aerobic digestion. Uh, you kind of have a factor there where aerobic digestion is a continued, basically a very extended aeration system, but you have different communities of bacteria present in aerobic and anaerobic digestion. And particularly if you have waste activated sludge, which has already been somewhat degraded through aerobic phase in your process, like an aeration basin, aerobic bacteria aren't going to be as efficient at reducing the remaining nutrients in the sludge and won't break down the volume quite as well. Whereas if you put them in an anaerobic digester, you end up with a different community of bacteria which can complement the aerobes in order to do a more efficient job breaking down solids. A couple downsides are anaerobic digesters are expensive to build and design. They require highly stable conditions. Otherwise, thanks to our fragile methanogens, they can have a lot of upsets occur if you don't have good condition stability. And most digesters are efficient at removing carbon, but not great at ammonia and phosphorus. You need an additional process in order to remove ammonia and phosphate from a system. In fact, it'll tend to release more ammonia and phosphate into the solution, necessitating a step of aerobic digestion afterwards to remove these nutrients. Next thing, just a brief mention, you have a couple different types of anaerobic digesters here. You have a mesophilic community or digester, which runs from 90 to 95 degree Fahrenheit most of the time, though sometimes I'll see them more like 100, 101. You want to avoid 98 degrees because that will make pathogens more likely to thrive in the digester. And generally one of the goals of a digester is to reduce pathogens, not grow more. Uh, thermophilic digesters are going to operate at a warmer temperature range, like 125 to 135 Fahrenheit. And you'll see thermophilic digesters, thanks to that higher temperature, uh, require about a third of the time in order to reduce the or to digest the sludge effectively that's being fed into the system. All digesters operate best at a pH range of about 6.8 to 7.2, and 7 to 7.2 is usually considered optimal. So anaerobic digesters are interesting and have unique nutritional requirements compared to aerobic systems. A classic thing we talk about a lot in activated sludge systems and aerobic treatments is BOD to N to P ratio. Well, in anaerobic digesters, BOD is a bit misleading because you're not, you're not using oxygen in the digestion process. In fact, oxygen is already depleted. So usually they just rely on COD measurements for anaerobic digestion. Um, but Generally, anaerobic digesters have a wide range of COD to N to P requirements, but for the most part, they require a lot less nitrogen and phosphorus relative to carbon than aerobic treatments. In fact, we're usually seeing around 1,000 to 7 to 1 COD to N to P to 250 to 7 to 1 uh, COD to N to P, rather than what we look at in aerobic systems, which is about 100 to 10 to 1 BOD to N to P. So, because anaerobic digestion as a metabolism method is less efficient than aerobic digestion, you tend to need a lot more carbon for energy production. Also in this pyramid, we see iron and sulfur um, would be around 0.2 in this ratio, um, which is more by quite a bit than what we'd typically call a micronutrient. And I'll talk a bit more about that in the next couple slides. All right, so now we're gonna branch a little bit into micronutrients, um, which starting off with iron and sulfur, like I said, they're typically a higher concentration than what you typically call a micronutrient. But interestingly, so the requirements for sulfur are fairly high in anaerobic digestion, but having too much sulfur can be a problem because higher levels of sulfur tend to favor um, sulfate reducing bacteria over methanogens, and they kind of have a competitive relationship in these cases. So if you have higher levels of sulfur, you need to feed additional iron into the digester in order to precipitate the sulfur present. So it's not necessarily that you need a ton of iron in anaerobic digesters, but based on high levels of sulfur that are frequently present, often you do need to supplement iron in order to control sulfur levels in the anaerobic digester. In addition, sometimes you have to worry about trace metal toxicity or inhibition in anaerobic digestion, but this doesn't happen very frequently with iron because it is so inclined to precipitate out with things like sulfur or phosphate present in an anaerobic digester. Generally, our trace metals, we're seeing at about one-tenth or less of the concentration of iron, 
Calcium and magnesium are an interesting little thing I want to mention. We had a recent case where we were working with a UASB system and doing some metal analysis on it. So calcium and magnesium in aerobic systems are a critical part of flock formation. They help bacteria form coagulates and stick together. And this is also very important in UASB systems with the formation of large stable granules. So I was looking through a bit of literature and I was seeing about 200 parts per million calcium is optimal for granule formation in UASBs, which is quite a bit, a lot more than you need of a typical micronutrient. But ensuring you have enough calcium and magnesium can aid in the formation of UASB granules and could help improve dewatering characteristics or settling characteristics where needed in anaerobic systems as well. So continuing on, uh, we have our micronutrients. Generally, iron, like I said, is about 0.2% of COD is what you need in the system. Uh, while this is normally present in high levels, or you need more iron to address higher sulfur levels, generally iron is not very soluble, which means you usually have very high levels of iron present in digester sludge, but very low levels soluble in the bulk liquid of the digester. Uh, the next few micronutrients here are kind of the keys for methanogenesis in anaerobic digestion, which is usually our main focus because methanogens are the most frail bacterial population in anaerobic digesters. Uh, we have nickel, we have cobalt, and we have molybdenum. Nickel is only used by methanogens. It's a unique requirement and typically is represented as about 0.001% of COD loading. So you can see you don't need very much nickel at all, but if nickel is absent from your system, your digester is not going to work. Uh, similar with cobalt, cobalt is also used for other bacteria as well. Um, both of these help with acetate utilization in order to make the methanogens function more efficiently. Generally about 0.1 pound of cobalt for 1,000 pounds of CODs or 0.01% is recommended. Uh, molybdenum is also an important enzyme cofactor for methanogenesis. And generally, its um, acceptable loading rate for molybdenum is considered to be about 0.05 pounds per 1,000 pounds. Now, important note about metals. Uh, they have recommended concentrations you can find on most metals in anaerobic digesters, but frequently a digester will function near optimally, even with levels of metals that are significantly lower than the recommendations. And a lot of the time, having some metal present at all will make a dramatic difference versus having no metal present but bumping up a slightly deficient metal concentration to being optimal will have a minor effect on the system. Now, these should be considered in a case-by-case -case basis. If you've done analysis and you're noticing a few minor deficiencies and you find on your site you can address them and that improves methanogenesis, great. But in a lot of cases, it'll make a fairly minor difference if you have some of the metals present, uh, particularly in the bulk liquid in the digester. So a few other metals, uh, we began our metals testing for anaerobic digestion. Definitely reach out to us and ask about it if you have any questions. Uh, we can test aluminum, calcium, chromium, copper, magnesium, uh, manganese, potassium, selenium, sodium, and zinc as well. These metals all have some perform, uh, important roles in anaerobic digestion and can contribute to metal inhibition. So we like to evaluate the numbers, but iron, nickel, cobalt, and molybdenum are kind of the big four metals. I also want to give a little shout out to selenium. It's important to, uh, it's just not that important to acetoclastic methanogens or methanogens that use acetate in order to produce methane. Uh, selenium is more helpful for hydrogenotrophic methanogens, which is a difficult word to say, but either way, hydrogenotrophic methanogens are converting carbon dioxide and hydrogen into methane and they have an essential role in assisting the acetoclastic methanogens because hydrogen can be inhibiting in anaerobic digesters if it accumulates. So you need some population of these present. And if you don't have any selenium, that process is not going to work well. Uh, generally, hydrogenotrophic methanogens make up less than 20% of the bulk methane production in anaerobic digesters. So they aren't as important as acetoclastic methanogens, but they are still important. So here's just an example of our metals testing for anaerobic digesters. Uh, you can see here, we take measurements on all of these. And one of the keys to our analysis and something we were hoping to improve upon uh, versus mo many other places that do metal analysis for anaerobic digesters is looking at insoluble and soluble levels of metals present. Because insoluble metals are not bioavailable to methanogens or uh, acetogens and therefore 
you could have a high level of insoluble metals present but still be experiencing a metal deficiency in your system depending on the solubility of the metals present. So like here, I noticed that cobalt levels were lower than they should have been optimally in the system, but we'll see in terms of soluble metal concentrations, we actually had low levels of iron, molybdenum, and selenium in this digester as well. Uh, and they were seeing a fairly low percent availability in all of the metals, where we're assuming the soluble metals are bioavailable and the insoluble metals are not. Uh, there is a little bit of, it's not 100% clear cut. Occasionally, bacteria will be able to access insoluble metals and use them as a metal supplement. But, and occasionally, soluble metals could be in a form that is not bioavailable. But most of the time, this gives us an effective representation for bioavailability of metals and can inform us better about how toxic metals might be in a system or that kind of thing as well. All right, so how do you tell? After looking at all these metal numbers, how do you tell if you need a trace metal supplement? Or in some cases, how do you tell if metals might be causing a problem and actually inhibiting your digester and maybe adding a trace metal supplement might make it worse? So we look at the soluble versus insoluble metals dominantly here. So performing the metal analysis, as we discussed in the previous slide, and, um, and beginning to supplement metals on site that you see low levels of soluble metals present, uh, combined with once you begin applying the metals, uh, you should be seeing a pretty dramatic boost in methane production in a fairly short period of time if they are actually working. So closely monitoring uh, biogas production after supplementing a metal can show you if it is actually working or not. If you don't see a boost, you might want to discontinue adding that metal because it may it's not helping and it may actually cause problems in the long run in a system. All right. So a couple of other notes about thermophilic versus mesophilic digesters, because this is kind of important for people running these types of systems. A thermophilic, like we said, faster treatment. We have higher quality sludge products. So the only way you're going to be able to effectively produce class A sludge is using a thermophilic digester. In addition, one thing we've seen is thermophilic digesters do a better job of breaking down waste activated sludge filaments with limited foaming. And mesophilic systems, the filaments can sometimes hang around for about a month. And that can cause repeated foaming events in a mesophilic digester if you feed a high filament waste activated sludge into them. But mesophilic digesters have greater stability and tend to be easier to maintain heating and require less insulation and things like that and a lot less energy input for heating. So basically, if you're able to maintain a very stable waste stream, thermophilic digestion can be very helpful in speeding up treatment. But if you're going to have a little bit more variability in your waste stream, Mesophilic digesters are usually the better option because they're less likely to crash and burn. All right, so I wanted to go through a couple of the common types of anaerobic digestion systems uh, we work with and a few of the pros and cons of each of them as well. So starting with a complete mixed anaerobic digester, they're our most standard anaerobic digestion system. They have usually a recirculating pump mixing the sludge or they have a mechanical impeller. So they tend to have efficient mixing and that makes them good at reducing solids levels in waste streams. They're better for dig digesting things like waste activated sludge or primary sludge solids. Uh, and that's why they're frequently used in municipal systems. Uh, they don't have as intense requirements for the feed. You can feed pretty much whatever you want into them. In addition, as opposed to like a lagoon or something, they take up quite a bit less space and they tend to generate better quality biogas than a lagoon system because you're able to maintain a more consistent environment. And thanks to the increased mixing, you're able to do a better job with uh, disintegration steps and hydrolysis steps most of the time in the digestion process. However, lagoons have their pros as well. Despite not having effective mixing most of the time, uh, lagoons are inexpensive to build and they do offer effective treatments in many cases. We see a lot of issues with lagoons maintaining a consistent temperature or temperature variation throughout the lagoon, but a lot of the time they still work okay, particularly if you're not, uh, you don't have a goal to produce really high quality biogas. Uh, but we have seen enough lagoon systems produce good quality biogas that we know they are viable to do that. All right, so our next anaerobic system is UASBs or complete, and we're going to compare them a little bit to complete mixed systems as well. I mentioned earlier, UASBs are forming granules, uh, so anaerobic sludge granules, and this enables them to have a much higher flow through rate of soluble wastewater. So they're 
efficient at reducing very high levels of soluble COD present. In fact, um, this is among the best ways to do things like treat, I don't know, really sugary waste streams or things like that, that have low levels of solids but high levels of COD, because you have granules that can stay in a system for extended periods of time with a high circulation rate of liquid over them, so you can end up recirculating the liquid over the granules multiple times to get more efficient treatment of, C of COD. Main downside, of course, is that upsets can lead to loss of granules, and granules take a very long time to grow, and they can be difficult to source in some cases, though I think the availability of granules has been improving lately. So we're starting to see more UASBs pop up in industry, which means you're more likely to have a neighboring facility with a UASB where you're able to pick up granules from if you need to reseed the system quickly. Growing the granules will frequently take months, so growing them on your own is a very slow startup method. Uh, even the best case, like anaerobic digesters, like a complete mixed system, can take like three months to start up, even if you have good operating conditions. And a USB could easily take two or three times that long. They can take forever to start up if your goal is to grow fairly large granules. Uh, and you can't run them at their full recirculation rate. In fact, the bigger the granules are, the faster you can recirculate liquid over them. So USB uh, operational parameters vary significantly from site to site, but I've looked through the upflow rates that are typical, and usually we'll see around 0.31 to 0.46 meters per hour, but they can be over 1.5 meters per hour for the upflow rate if you have a fairly high COD load and you want to recirculate it multiple times. Uh, generally, the higher the upflow rate, the larger the granules will become, but this is a gradual process. So for example, if you were starting up a UASB, you would start with a slow upflow rate because you want some granules to form and you'd be rinsing more free particulate solids out of the system and then you could gradually accelerate the upflow rate in order to slowly produce larger and larger granules. All right, so the key for anaerobic digestion is maintaining a stable environment and the best way to do that is to regulate your waste stream and also take frequent measurements to know if anything in your waste stream is varied from typical uh, waste stream conditions. So biogas quality measurements are one of the best ways to do this. Uh, biogas quality, usually you want 60 to 70% methane for methane percentages. Less than 60% indicates an issue in the system most of the time, but if you have a bad quality substrate, you may be satisfied with getting like 55% methane generation, but you really don't want to be much lower than that. I have seen some sites get well over 70% methane generation if they have a really good quality substrate and their nutrient requirements are met effectively by their waste stream. So you get a wide variety, but these are very nice measurements to take because usually they're pretty easy measurements you can take for methane concentration. You can use a methane meter to measure methane levels. Uh, or you could just have a methane torch and look at what color it is at different times per day. If it's more bluish, you can be pretty sure you have higher levels of methane. And if it's more orangish, you can be pretty sure you have lower levels of methane. But it's an easy, sensitive measurement. And if you notice a problem with methane production, you can be reasonably sure that you may have a digester upset uh, oncoming. And you can prepare uh, your site for that upcoming upset to address it as quickly as possible to prevent a major problem. The other sensitive form of testing to predict a digester upset is volatile acid to alkalinity testing. You don't want a ratio of volatile acids to alkalinity that's greater than 0.34, so it should always be less than that. It really should be around 0.1. Exceptionally high volatile acid levels can lead to foaming and pH drops. High alkalinity can also lead to foaming. In fact, interestingly, volatile acids and alkalinity present in digesters both can act as surfactants. I'll be talking a bit more about surfactants in the next few slides, but basically a surfactant reduces the surface tension of a digester liquid, allowing bubbles to begin to form more easily, which can increase the risk of foaming. So you have alkalinity and volatile acids are keys to digester operation. You need to be producing volatile acids and you need to have sufficient alkalinity to address the volatile acids present. Uh, but if the levels of both get too high, you can start to have foaming, even if your digester is otherwise functioning quite well. Metal analysis, particularly if you take a new waste stream or something into your digester, performing metals analysis on the waste stream to see how it might skew the system can be helpful. Metals analysis is also very good for indicating if you're depleting metals in a system. For example, if you perform metal analysis on a plant, a digester effluent, 
and you notice soluble metals are totally depleted from the digester effluent, you can be pretty sure the digester would benefit from more of the metals that are getting depleted. Uh, this is a good way to increase digester stability and prevent upsets is just being aware of metal concentrations and supplementing where needed because the more the better metals are supplemented, the happier your methanogens are going to be and the less likely they are going to be upset by something. Influent loading measurements are helpful as well. Fluctuations in loading are one of the leading causes of upsets in anaerobic digesters. So measuring COD to N to P ratio coming into the system as well as total COD concentration is very helpful in predicting an upset. If you notice a spike in incoming COD, you might want to hold some defoamer or something on site, and as well as a pH adjuster just to make sure the pH doesn't start to drop in your digester and you have something on hand to deal with it if it does. Another nice thing to do is run biomethane potential studies, which can allow you to begin to optimize your digestion process. Basically, you grab a digester sludge sample and you take some of your influent and you put them in a bottle at a reasonable proportion to each other and you let that bottle sit for about a month sometimes a little longer is beneficial sometimes it doesn't need that much time and you see how much methane is generated and you can supplement different metals or add different digester additives and if you see they lead to a boost in methane production you can be sure they will help on site and you can slowly use these studies in order to optimize your system performance even if you're getting pretty decent results to begin with and the more optimized your digester performance is, the more stable your system is going to be, so you're not as likely to encounter upsets if little things go wrong, like your loading fluctuates a little bit or something like that. So these are very useful as well. They can be a little expensive to run, and you need to be proactive with them because they take a long time to get the results back. So next thing, let's talk a little bit about problems that occur in anaerobic digestion. We already touched on these a little bit, but first one would be acidification. This is the most common issue we see in anaerobic digesters where the pH starts to drop in the digester. Generally, if acidification is occurring in your digester and the pH starts to drop, you have been too slow already to address the problem. That's why we're measuring volatile acid to alkalinity ratio. So you can see acidification occurring before your pH begins to drop, and you can therefore supplement alkalinity immediately to prevent any pH drop from happening. More sensitive indicators would be like less loss of biogas, but sometimes we'll see loss of biogas without any acidification component. Sometimes this is related to the degradability of the feed sludge being poor, or poor hydrolysis taking place where your digester isn't getting upset but it may have large loads of undegraded substrate present, and that means biogas isn't being produced because you need to degrade the substrates in order to produce the biogas. Toxicity is something which people bring up to us a lot, but doesn't appear to happen that much in anaerobic digesters. Uh, there are some areas where toxicity may be more likely, particularly if you're an industrial system. I've been concerned about parasitic acid being fed into anaerobic digestion in some cases because it's an oxidizer. Uh, in addition, sometimes we will see metal concentrations which are too high, especially in lower pH conditions, and this can lead to a persistent upset. All right, so acidification. Volatile acids increase and eventually can cause the pH to drop and first will cause a skewing of your volatile acid to alkalinity ratio. Once pH has dropped outside of healthy anaerobic digestion range, methane production will stop completely. Unfortunately, your acetogens will keep producing volatile acids for the methanogens to consume well outside the healthy pH range for methanogens, which means you can have a downward spiral where you produce more and more acid, it's not getting used up, and the pH keeps dropping more and more uh, until you hit a pH of like 4 where most of the activity in the anaerobic digester is starting to stop and you start to smell really stinky things like butyric acid in the system. But one critical thing to keep in mind is if you address pH adjustments early, like when you're at around pH 6.5, or better yet, before you've seen any drop at all, you don't need a lot of alkalinity supplement in order to maintain a stable digester. But if you let the pH drop to the 4.5 to 5.5 range, you're encountering what's referred to as a buffered region, where it is very difficult to adjust the pH in the anaerobic digester. And it can take tens to hundreds of times the amount of pH adjuster, like I don't know, magnesium hydroxide or something, in order to raise the pH back to a healthy range because your volatile acids are not as proportionate to pH in that range. So really watch out for that. You never want to be waiting on a pH supplement 
until your pH drops to the 4.5 to 5.5 range cuz you'll it'll be a ridiculous amount of base you need to add. This is something that's come up a lot over the years where people will add like 100 pounds of uh, magnesium hydroxide and be like, we need something different. pH adjustment doesn't appear to be working, so it's got to be something else. And it's like, no, you do need to supplement something to raise your pH in your digester, but 100 pounds is not a drop in the bucket. Really, you'll need 10,000 pounds or something to adjust the pH. Uh, You can run something called a titration, which you can find on our Aquafix website for the Boost and Lock page simple titration method, and that'll give you a better sense for how much pH additive you need to add in order to correct the pH. But the main thing is watch out for this 4.5 to 5.5 pH range. It's a buffered zone, so you will end up adding a very disproportionate amount of additional base once you hit that region. Once the pH gets above 5.5, if you're using a strong base like sodium hydroxide, you need to proceed cautiously because it can be very easy to overcorrect the pH because you're no longer in that buffered region. And you don't want to be raising the pH up to 9 or 10 in your anaerobic digester either. You want to get it as close to 7 as possible. So I mentioned a couple causes of loss of biogas production, but there's a number of reasons for this. Main thing to consider, methanogens are quite sensitive to toxicity. Like I said before, The population of methanogens is much less diverse in anaerobic digesters than populations of acid-forming bacteria, which means they can't survive as wide a range of conditions. And all of the steps you take to maintain a stable anaerobic digester are to encourage as many methanogens to grow as possible. Methanogens have a very low growth rate. In some cases, you can see as much as 28 days Some methanogens have a doubling time of closer to 10 days. Some it's more like a week for a doubling time. But some of the slower ones are more like 28 days in a mesophilic system. And you want to have as many different methanogens present as possible, which means to have a really optimally functioning digester, you might need to have over 28 days to get as diverse a population of methanogens as possible where you've had stable conditions in order to have a diverse methanogen population. Loss of biogas tends to precede acidification, which means it is a very sensitive way to tell if an upset is coming, but it doesn't always result in acidification in a digester. Like I said, if you have large clumps of solids entering in your system or something like that, you could have disintegration and hydrolysis be a rate-limiting step, which means you're not producing any volatile acids, which means your digester is not likely to be upset, but your substrate is not going to degrade and you won't get effective solids disintegration. This can also be an indicator of just a poor quality feedstock where you're not getting very much methanogen production. Sometimes you'll actually see competing organisms to methanogens start to overgrow like sulfide-producing bacteria or salt for reducers. If you have a lot of that growth, they can outcompete the methanogens and be using similar food substrates, which can kind of starve out the methanogens. So you wouldn't see a pH drop necessarily in those cases, but your methanogens would shut off and you wouldn't get biogas production as well. So toxicity. Interestingly, toxicity in a lot of anaerobic digestion cases is environmentally dependent. Trace metals, lower pHs increase the likelihood that you'll have toxic levels of trace metals present. Because we showed in the example earlier, you have very high levels of insoluble metals versus soluble metals, but that ratio can change quite a bit if your pH begins to drop in your digester. Which means if your digester pH drops, this is another thing you have to look out for, is you're actually facilitating a more toxic environment because metals are becoming more and more soluble, and frequently that means you will have toxic levels of metals present in your digester, which your system will not be used to. A lot of the time, digesters can acclimate to toxic levels of metals if they're persistently high. But if they're occasionally high, they stress out the system a lot more. For example, if you had a pH drop and it released 10 times as much of cobalt into the system as you normally see, that could easily cause a toxic event and make your recovering of the digester a lot more difficult. But fortunately, if you increase the pH, the solubility of that cobalt will go back down again. It just might make it feel like when you're adjusting the pH up, it keeps wanting to drop back down again, and you're going to have some difficulty stabilizing the system. On the opposite end of the spectrum, ammonia toxicity is also a possibility in anaerobic digesters. And ammonia can be toxic at 50 parts per million, which is not that high a concentration. But in an effective digester pH range, 
you're very unlikely to have 50 parts per million of ammonia present. Most of it will be NH4 plus or ammonium, which is not toxic to digesters most of the time. However, once you hit around pH 7.5, you start to see a dramatic increase in levels of ammonia relative to ammonium, thanks to that pH shift, which can make toxicity occur in your anaerobic digester. The fortunate thing with ammonia toxicity as most toxic symptoms lead to a declining of the pH, so it will tend to correct itself in many cases where your digester will get a little upset and then the pH will drop a little bit and then the problem will go away because the ammonia will be converted to ammonium again at pHs below 7.5. Salt toxicity is also a frequent issue, particularly in cases where you're doing large pH adjustments. So watch out when you're doing pH adjustments. Don't add too much sodium. That's one of the most common causes of toxicity in digesters, but it's another case where if you have persistently high sodium levels, your digester will acclimate well and it's not likely to be a problem, but if it's occasional like you dumped in a bunch of sodium bicarbonate to fix the pH, you're going to have to overcome some issues with sodium toxicity as well when you're attempting to fix your digester problem. Another interesting problem that's come up a few times in anaerobic digestion throughout the years is sludge volume expansion. This is caused by the entrapment of biogas in solids and tends to be influenced by the viscosity of solids in the sludge. So things like biopolymers might increase the viscosity of the sludge. Biopolymers are produced by bacteria in order to encourage them to stick together or store food, that kind of thing. Uh, but you can also have a substrate which increases the viscosity of the digester sludge allowing bubbles to be trapped in the column. And this is a difficult problem to address because defoamers tend to be a lot less efficient at dealing with sludge volume expansion than foaming. So the best solution for sludge volume expansion is to increase mixing, but then you're gonna want to have a defoamer on hand because when you're freeing all the bubbles from the sludge, you're likely to increase the risk of foaming in your system. Higher mixing tends to make foaming more likely, just the agitation fact but also you're going to be releasing a lot of bubbles at once to the surface. So this can cause additional foaming in the system. So you have, if you have a defoamer on site, you can start to correct the foaming right away to, once you're addressing the sludge volume expansion as well. I haven't seen too much information about how defoamers work on the actual sludge volume expansion problem, but they tend to be efficient at collapsing foam as long as the solids content is not too high. Generally, with sludge volume expansion, it's best to increase mixing and then treat it as a foaming issue because it's easier to address the foam than the bubbles trapped within the sludge volume. All right, so now that we've talked about sludge volume expansion and how it relates to foaming a little bit, we should talk about foaming because it is the most common problem we've seen in anaerobic digesters. So there's three factors in an anaerobic digester which contribute to foaming, and Several of them are, well, all of them are going to always be present all the time because you're trying to digest solids in an anaerobic digester, so solid levels are going to be high. Surfactants are naturally being produced in the anaerobic digestion process. Like we talked about, volatile acids act as a surfactant. The goal is to produce volatile acids so that the methanogens can pick them up to produce methane. And gas production, of course, is the goal of anaerobic digestion. So if your digester is functioning well, you will usually have a little bit of foaming present in your digester at all times. But what you want to watch out for is as solids concentrations increase in the digester, say you're feeding a little too much solids, you tend to encourage the foam to be more and more stable. Another way we could look at this would be like feeding waste activated sludge into an anaerobic system. You might be feeding filamentous organisms, which would be elevating the solids level and also making it sort of more of a intertwined mesh of solids, which is better at trapping gas. So the solids concentration is gonna begin to stabilize the foam more and more. And then you'll typically have a big foaming event occur once you have higher levels of solids so that you're in the middle of this sort of Venn diagram thing here. You want to sit more on the outsides of the Venn diagram and not sit in this very middle. So you can have gas production and solids and a little bit of surfactants. You can have some gas production and a little bit of surfactants and you'll be fine. But if you have too high levels of all three, you're going to have an issue. Big case is, of course, back to our pH adjustment example. Say you have your digester pH drop to six. It sits there for a while. You raise the pH back up to seven. Suddenly your methanogens all kick in at once. 
there's higher levels of surfactants present in the system and solids haven't been degrading as well in the system as typical, then you tend to have a lot of foam production. So with foaming, a lot of the time your digester will fix it on its own just by stabilizing. So if you know an upset is oncoming that would lean to foaming, like your pH has dropped a little bit, maybe the temperature dropped in your digester a little bit, um, have some defoamer on hand in order to collapse the foam and be a little cautious, maybe turn down mixing a little bit in your digester to reduce the risk of foaming taking place. Because once it starts to happen, it's a little harder to deal with than if you're looking at it more as a preventative. This might lead to foaming, so I'm going to address this now kind of thing. So here's a quick diagram on how a surfactant works. Surfactants interfere with something called hydrogen bonding, which occurs to produce surface tension in water, which people must, uh, most people are very familiar with surface tension. It's why water forms droplets and that kind of thing. Basically, if you don't have a surfactant present, hydrogen bonds will effectively rip apart bubbles that form. Like if you run a faucet into a sink full of water, you'll see a little bit of bubbles, but they'll collapse basically immediately. But if you interfere with that hydrogen bonding by adding something like a soap, so a drop of dish water in your sink, you'll start to see the foam increasing in volume and start to overflow your sink, which is the same thing that's happening in an anaerobic digester. Uh, this is not a big problem if you have a nonpolar oil or something on the surface, but having an oil-water interface can also reduce the surface tension of a solution, making foaming more likely. It's just less problematic than something like a soap because they are separated out, which means the water still has an opportunity to hydrogen bond at the surface. So here's a quick diagram of what sort of things are going to be contributing to foaming in a digester. You might have some filaments, you'll have solids, you'll have biogas, all forming this intertangled mass at the surface of the digester. And as your methanogens continue to produce more and more methane and carbon dioxide is produced more and more in the anaerobic digestion process, everything will get trapped at the surface and lead to foaming, which will overflow the system. In many cases, you can have damage, uh, mechanical damage to your digester. I've seen floating covers collapse, that kind of thing, which is a real mess. It's of course a major housekeeping issue if foam overflows your digester and begins to cover your plant. That can be a safety issue. It can allow for oxygen to get into the system. This is a major issue, which means you're gonna to wanna to be cautious of particularly filaments if you're feeding waste to activated sludge, feeding surfactants into a digester is bad, but volatile acids naturally being there, you're going to want to make sure that your volatile acid levels are not getting too high and you're neutralizing them as best as possible as they elevate. And then solids concentrations, lowering the solids concentration is always a good way to reduce the risk of foaming as well. In addition, like I said, more mixing releases more air bubbles and has increased ed or more biogas bubbles and also increases the agitation, making foaming more likely as well. So if you're beginning to see a foaming upset taking place, reducing the mixing or doing intermittent mixing can help with the issue, uh, but it may make your process less efficient overall in the long run. So it's more of a temporary solution than a permanent solution in many cases. Unfortunately, foaming can be pretty hard to diagnose the cause of when it's occurring in anaerobic digesters. There's many things that lead to a stressed out methanogen population, which increases volatile acid levels, making foaming more likely. You might have a temperature change, you might have an organic loading change, you might have mild toxicity taking place, and the methanogens are just going to go take a break. They're like, we don't like this, we're going to stop working for a bit, and then you start to see the increase in volatile acids, and even if your pH doesn't drop, the methanogens are going to, once the stressful conditions limited a little bit, are going to kick back in, produce a bunch of biogas, and that's where you'll see foaming in most cases. Another thing I wanted to address, because we have a lot of samples come in where people are looking to see if they have filaments in their anaerobic digester sample, and if they could be contributing to foaming taking place, this is unusual. But we'll talk about a couple examples where this does happen and what makes foaming due to filaments likely. and a little bit about is it possible to even have filaments in an anaerobic digester that grow there naturally. So we've observed many cases where we've seen filamentous organisms in anaerobic digesters. What they all have in common is that the filaments are entering from an activated sludge system and being fed into the digester. We have not observed any cases where filaments are actually growing anaerobically. Uh, however, Filaments can survive an extensive period of time in an anaerobic digester, in some cases as long as a month. 
in most of these cases, you're going to want to perform microanalysis on the activated sludge sample you're feeding into the anaerobic digester in order to identify the filament because anaerobic digestion can distort the shape of filaments present in the system, making identification more difficult. However, with that in mind, it is possible that filaments could be growing purely anaerobically. It just seems to be a really rare phenomenon. And I've read a couple articles which talked about filamentous growth in anaerobic systems. I'm waiting to see a good sample where they're clearly having some foaming occur. So far, the only time I've suspected something was having a problem with anaerobic filaments. It was a UASB system. The filament levels were not that high, but I suspected they may have been contributing to poor granule size. But if you have an anaerobic digester that is not fed any waste-activated sludge and you're pretty certain there are filaments growing, send it our way so we can study it because this is an issue that comes up frequently and I just haven't found a sample in order to begin to study uh, the idea of anaerobic filamentous growth. The main filament we see in anaerobic digesters has persistently been Microthrix parvicella because of its ability to survive for long periods of time in anaerobic digesters. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about Microthrix parvicella here. So on the left image, I took some Microthrix pictures from a, a local wastewater plant in, in the Madison area. Basically, Microthrix parvicella was growing in their activated sludge system in pretty high levels. And we were noticing in their anaerobic digester, they had a bunch of filaments which looks like they could have been Microthrix parvicella, but morphologically their shape was a little bit wrong and their staining characteristics were a little bit wrong making the identification less conclusive. Uh, I looked into this further and was looking through a few articles on the anaerobic persistence of Microthrix parvicella, and we found Microthrix parvicella can exist for extended periods of time in anaerobic digesters and will lead to poor gram stain results, loss of nizer positive granules, and sort of a puffing up of the cells so that the cell shape becomes more visible than it would typically be in Microthrix parvicella in something like a waste-activated sludge sample. So based on this information, we were able to make a fairly informed guess that Microthrix parvicella was actually contributing to foaming in the anaerobic digester. Uh, so here's a couple close-up pictures. You can see we have nizer positive granules and the image to the left, which is the distinctive identifying trait of Microthrix parvicella. And on the right, we're seeing puffier cells, but no nizer positive granules, meaning it's not distinctively identifiable as Microthrix parvicella. We were able to see this sort of thing under the wet mount as well, where you start to see puffy sort of spherical cells rather than the difficult to observe cells that you generally can't clearly see Microthrix parvicella cells in wastewater sample. They're too small and they're kind of, uh, they're just difficult to view. So filamentous bacteria can contribute to foaming in anaerobic systems, and the reason for that is we talked about how solids levels will influence the likelihood of foaming in anaerobic digester. Well, filaments are kind of like the worst type of solids possible. They form this interweaving net which can trap other solids in the digester to make a thicker solids layer at the surface of the digester. They can, to some extent, produce surfactants, but basically you get this complex net rather than free solids, which allows it to trap more biogas, leading to more foam. They will degrade in an anaerobic digester, but in the case of Microthrix parvicella, we know they can survive at least a month in anaerobic digestion. We haven't seen a lot of evidence that filaments can actually metabolize, but we know they can stick around for quite a while. Uh, you know, looking at this quite a bit, the month survival time is more typical of a mesophilic digester, and in thermophilic digesters, I found that the filaments are rarely identifiable at all in maintaining any shape, even for a couple days. So it seems like in a thermophilic digester, filaments will lead to a very short burst of foaming, and then the filaments will degrade, whereas in a mesophilic digester, they can just sit there for a longer period of time. So if you have a lot of filaments in your waste-activated sludge, be careful about feeding it into your anaerobic digester. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about correcting and preventing upsets in anaerobic digesters. Monitoring, of course, is the key, particularly looking at biogas concentrations, volatile acid levels, and volatile acid to alkalinity ratio. As you have an increase in volatile acids or a decrease in alkalinity, you know an upset is coming and you can begin to supplement something like our Boost and Lock product to correct the alkalinity levels before the pH begins to drop. If pH does drop, you're already too late to address the issue easily and you're going to have a major problem 
you're going to want to get some defoamer on hand as well because you're likely to have a big foaming event once you correct the pH. And you may need thousands of pounds of pH adjusting product. Consistent loading is always good. If you have some way of holding digest or feed like an EQ tank or something along those lines, uh, maintaining consistent loading will greatly reduce the risk of an upset. Most digesters become upset if the uh, loading rates change, particularly if you have a large increase in a short period of time. Trace metals can, of course, be monitored through metal analysis, and maintaining healthy levels in your system can help you have a much healthier population of methanogens, making your digester less likely to encounter an upset. The other thing to consider is digester cleanings. Regular digester cleanings can help avoiding loss of digester capacity, which can occur particularly if you've had years of things like pH adjustment taking place. Maybe you have some grit feeding into your digester. Sometimes we'll see a digester suddenly that's been working great for years begin to have frequent upsets, which are sort of inexplicable. A lot of that time, if your loading hasn't changed substantially and your digester starts having random upsets, you may want to consider a digester cleaning because likely this means your digester effective volume has reduced to the point where it is no longer capable of handling the waste stream. Sometimes you'll see over a third of digester capacity lost by things like grit buildup in digesters. So be careful, especially if it's been like 30 years since your last cleaning, something you may want to look into. All right, so for correcting an upset in anaerobic digestion, you're always going to want to make small changes to move gradually in the right direction. You don't want to move suddenly in one direction because that can upset the system even more. Your methanogens aren't able to cope with very quick changes, like if your pH suddenly increases from 6 to 7, or if something along those lines, the temperature is suddenly brought up from 75 degrees Fahrenheit to 95 degrees Fahrenheit, your methanogens aren't going to be ready. They're going to get overwhelmed. You're going to get a bunch of foam, and then your pH is likely going to drop in your digester or something along those lines. So make gradual small changes, perform adjustments in the matter of weeks rather than days, and just be patient with your digester. It's going to turn around if you give it the time, but if you expect it to turn around immediately, and it's not, so you do more to make it fix itself faster, you can actually make the problem worse in many cases. Also, if you're encountering an upset, Holding a defoamer on site can make it a lot less stressful. We have a defoam 3000 product, which you can look into if you're interested. Now, there's a variety of defoamers which will work. We tend to recommend against silicon defoamers. They can interact poorly with biology and wastewater systems and can also lead to the formation of silica granules, which can cause problems as well. All right, so next thing, pH adjustments and alkalinity. You're going to want to be careful, like I said, when the pH is above 5.5 using a strong base like sodium hydroxide because they raise the pH very quickly above this point because you're no longer in a buffered zone. So frequently people will see their digester pH spike way past 7 in these cases if they're not being cautious. That's why in a lot of these really large pH adjustment cases, you're going to want to adjust the pH to around 5.5 with a strong base and then kind of stop and use something weaker like magnesium hydroxide or boost and lock or sodium bicarbonate, something like that. That's not going to lead to the pH overshooting. Bicarbonate is really nice because it forms a buffered pH range of around 7 to 7.5. Uh, bicarbonate is actually what maintains your blood pH as well. Uh, just interesting fact there. If your blood pH changed dramatically, you would not have a good time. Uh, it doesn't take a large change in blood pH to cause you to basically die. So, But fortunately, bicarbonate buffering makes that very unlikely to happen. Uh, once the pH gets above 6, be cautious about foaming occurring as well because that's when the methanogens are going to really start to kick in. Methanogens really like a pH of above 6. In fact, 6.5 is when the methanogens are going to start to have more of a diverse community. You only have a couple methanogens that are working when you're around pH 6. So you'll suddenly see a rapid increase in biogas at pH 6.5 as well, which will often lead to foaming when you're doing these pH adjustments. Uh, so boost and lock. The reason we developed this supplement for, large, uh, for pH adjustments is because, one, we wanted to avoid having something that contained too much sodium. High levels of sodium can cause digester upsets. If you naturally have a high sodium waste stream, this is less concerning. But you know, high levels of sodium can be a problem in many systems and can interfere with things like sludge coagulation and granule formation in UASBs as well. 
Boost and lock will work for large pH adjustments, but we usually recommend it for more of a maintenance and smaller pH adjustment like pH 6.5 to 7, you could use some boost and lock. Once you have a lower pH than 6.5, particularly a lower pH than 6, you might want to use something, just whatever you can get cheap because you're probably going to need a lot of it. To talk a little bit about Anazyme G, uh, we just started a new line of anaerobic products including Anazyme G and Anazyme P. Uh, to aid in anaerobic digestion, these are biocatalyst products. In the case of Anazyme G, it's designed to facilitate a more rapid breakdown of fats, oils, and greases into short-chain fatty acids, hopefully uh, accelerating anaerobic digestion. This is similar to a product that is used for aerobic digestion processes, uh, and it can help increase the efficiency of fat degradation pretty distinctively. So talking a little bit about some data on it, uh, we have our individual fatty acid concentrations here from a study we ran partnered with UW Oshkosh and UW Stevens Point. We like to work with a lot of different universities on this type of testing to get sort of an objective third party uh, weighing in on experimentation and that sort of thing. So UW Oshkosh ran a standard 28-day BNP test uh, and then sent the samples out to University of Wisconsin Stevens Point, Wisconsin Institute for Sustainable Technology, and they measured out fatty acid concentrations. And the goal here is to show that uh, Anazyme G was able to lead to reduced concentrations of fatty acids, and it was also not leading to an accumulation of short-chain fatty acids. So we can see on these measurements, short-chain fatty acids would generally be like C6 is kind of getting into the short-chain fatty acid range, but usually we're talking about C2 to C4-ish range for short-chain fatty acids, going up to about butyric acid. But we didn't see any of those in any of these reactors after spiking them at the beginning of the test with quite a bit of butter, 50 parts per million butter was added. But we can see in our control without any anazyme G added, at the end of the test, we did see a measurable amount of C6 fatty acids sitting right at about 3,400 ppm. So basically, apologies, I misstated the fatty acid concentration. It was actually 10% here. Anyway, the fatty acid concentration was at 3,500 ppm of the control. And we can see in the other ones, there was no C6 remaining in any of the reactors. And we saw a reduction in longer chain fatty acids with the addition of anazyme G was sort of more optimal at the 1 ppm dose rate. We saw diminishing returns as we increased the dose rate. But we can see, uh, for example, uh, anazyme G at 20 parts per million led to a substantial reduction in C18 and in total fatty acids. Uh, observed in the reactors. And one thing we did notice with C20 is that we actually saw a little bit of C14 fatty acid, which means we actually were pushing a lot of those longer chain fatty acids, and some of them were at the uh, C14 range at the end of the digestion cycle uh, after doing this testing. So we're able to show here that the addition of anazyme G reduced total fatty acids and didn't cause a stress on the methanogens in these BMP tests, which led to any upsets. All right, so the next thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is our anaerobic food supplement. This is product is primarily designed to stabilize incoming feed to anaerobic digesters. Anaerobic food supplement is basically a blend of food that is containing some micronutrients and macronutrients which favor methanogens in periods of low or intermittent loading. You can add a little bit of this and it'll keep the methanogens active in periods you're not feeding the digester, so they're able to handle an increase in feeding later. And I'll contrast this a little bit to something like a biocatalyst product and how it influences biogas production in the next few slides. So here, uh, we're showing example of anaerobic food supplement compared to our control. And as a food supplement, the more food you feed into an anaerobic reactor, the more methane you are going to produce. So in this case, basically all of the anaerobic food supplement led to increased methane production, meaning it was an effective food source for methanogens, and it should work in these periods of low loading to keep them active in a system rather than go dormant and then get stressed out when feeding is resumed. A couple other biocatalyst products, we already talked about Anazyme G, but we also did some tests with Bug Juice and Anazyme P. Uh, bug Juice is a product we traditionally have used for aerobic uh, digestion processes to break down paper fiber in fats. And Anazyme P is designed to break down complex proteins in wastewater treatment systems, 
So we can see here that Anazine P and bug juice led to dramatic increases in methane production versus our control in this case, as opposed to the small bump we observed with the anaerobic food supplement. And that's because you can add food to an anaerobic system and lead to an increase in biogas, and that makes sense. But you're never going to be adding as much food as you could potentially source from your feed material if you're able to access undegradable material more easily. So these anazyme P and bug juice in these cases made undegraded materials more bioavailable for bacteria into the system, and this led to a dramatic increase in biogas production in our uh, 31 days this BMP test was run. Uh, by the way, this study, bug juice and anazyme P were applied as a one-time dose rate at five part per million at the beginning of the test, and this study was run by Digester Doctor Labs, uh, and we work with Will Charlton over there on some of our BMP testing. Uh, he's a good person to work with, does a lot of different tests for us. All right, so I thought I'd end out our webinar here with a nice example of a digester troubleshooting situation. So, because we talk a lot about the bacteria in a system, but there's a lot of things that can go wrong in anaerobic digesters. For example, we had this Wisconsin plant we worked with, which regularly had foaming problems in the winter. And what was causing the foaming in the winter? How do we know? So initially, when you talk about a plant in the winter, you might think of a couple things that could be leading to foaming. One was temperature drops. If your temperature drops in your digester, you tend to have increased volatile acid production relative to methane production, leading to a buildup in volatile acids, which increases the likelihood of foaming. In this case, there was no temperature drop, and we were really confused. By the way, additional detail here, this was actually two digesters being run in parallel with the splitter valve. So it would feed some sludge one day to one digester, some sludge another day to another digester. One was foaming quite a bit worse than the other one, but they were both foaming. So we continued on. We did a little bit of microanalysis because this client was concerned about foam in their sample caused by filamentous organisms. So we took a look at their mixed liquor sample from their activated sludge system. We were identifying some microfrix parvicella. We saw a lot of tangled filaments in their foam, which could have been contributing to increased foaming. So we were thinking maybe treating the filaments in the upstream system would be helpful to reducing foaming. Now, this did help a little bit, but we found out shortly after that the filaments were contributing to foaming, but an additional factor was a mechanical factor, which we can't look at under the microscope, but is important to consider whenever you have a parallel system like this where one digester is working and one digester is not. In this case, the additional problem was that the splitter valve was feeding quite a bit more sludge into one digester than the other, leading to much higher solids content in the digester that was foaming, which goes back to what we were talking about earlier, higher solids content tends to lead to increased foaming in anaerobic digesters. So the filaments were an interesting accessory to the issue and were likely contributing quite a bit, but they make a bigger difference if the solids concentration is higher in general. Uh, it's also important to note, these filaments did not grow anaerobically, like I said earlier. Microfrix parvicella is known to survive in anaerobic systems for 28 days, but it doesn't grow there. So we knew these filaments were coming from the waste activated sludge, but it wasn't the only problem it turned out. They were also having a mechanical issue. And this plant was really concerned about it. They were having like foam beginning to escape from their floating cover. They were worried about their cover tipping over basically due to the amount of foam they were getting. It was interfering with their biogas concentrations. It was pretty much a mess. So definitely consider the mechanical things. If you have a parallel system, it's really nice to have that as a reference because then you can compare if one digester is working to the other. It's a lot easier to make an assessment as to what the issue is. And you can even use it for like a little study you can run on site where you could apply a treatment to one digester and see if it helps with the foaming and not the other and see what works and what doesn't. But anyway, key takeaways from this presentation. Always remember, loading and temperature changes frequently lead to upsets. You want to have as stable a loading as possible. If you end up with a site that has frequent changes in loading just due to the nature of the facility, it's best to set it up in a way where you have the ability to store sludge in sort of an EQ type reactor so that you don't have to feed a ton of sludge one day from like a truckload of something brought in and nothing the next day. The consistency is always key. Also, of course, regular maintenance on digesters helps to prevent issues like temperature changes, loss of digester sludge volume from solids accumulation, these kind of things, which can also lead to more frequent upsets. 
Uh, definitely track your digester's nutrient feed. You want to have a good sense for your BOD to, or COD to N to P ratio at all times. It helps you get a better sense for what ratio of nutrient feed works the best in your digester system, what yields the best biogas production, that kind of thing. And it allows you to make adjustments when needed as well. Uh, fatty acid analysis and BMP studies are useful tools. Fatty acid analysis is nice because you can kind of see where digestion might be getting held up in an anaerobic system. And BMP studies allow for optimization, which is helpful as well. Our next thing, remember, filaments generally don't grow in digesters. So watch out for waste-activated sludge feeds in a lot of cases where you might have high levels of filaments in the waste-activated sludge because it could cause a lot of upsets. Anyway, here are some references for additional reading. If you have any questions about these, definitely let us know. We can provide you any of these articles and sources to give you some more information about anaerobic digestion if needed. And now, getting around to questions. I'm happy to see there's a lot of questions in the chat here. Starting off with Amy. With these products, um, I'm assuming you're talking about anaerobic food supplement or the um, Quicksime products, or the Anazyme or Quicksime products for anaerobic digestion. Uh, yes. If you have low loading, you're actually solubizing substrate present in the digester, which means you're actively providing them more food, which might be leading to increased methane generation and stabilize your digester. Uh, if you have undegraded food, you're a little bit susceptible to things like changes in environmental condition, making certain foods more available at certain times, which could lead to a spike in food availability, which could actually upset your digester. So, yeah, the Anazyme products and anaerobic food supplement are helpful during low loading periods in many cases in order to maintain a relatively stable food substrate concentration. All right, so we have a question about using bug juice in a complete mixed anaerobic digester. Uh, yes, that's actually a really good application for it. By bug juice will help to break down, particularly if you have a lot of paper fibers going into your digester, it's helpful. It also helps to deal with fats entering a digester, but you may want to consider Anazyme G if your only concern is fats. But it should help to reduce sludge volume uh, in your anaerobic digester and boost volatile solids destruction. We do have some literature on these if you want to reach out for more details on that. All right, continuing downward, I am interested in determining H2S, so hydrogen sulfide methane levels in wastewater effluent. Okay, so generally, if you mean wastewater effluent, I assume you mean in produced biogas present. Um, methane is not soluble in liquid, so it will be released very quickly. Uh, H2S, you can have soluble hydrogen sulfide. In a digester, it will generally convert fairly quickly to a gas form, but it can precipitate out. Uh, there are methods for measuring sulfides. You can send them out to many local environmental labs, and they can run that sort of test. I would generally reach out to a local lab, but if you have trouble finding somebody, let us know and we can get back to you with a specific lab you can try close to your site. All right, I have another question from, uh, several other questions from a Lokesh. Uh, again, sorry if I didn't pronounce that right. Is there any instrument for the analysis of these gases? Um, yeah, there are actually gas meters, which I would recommend looking into. I think Hawk may supply some gas meters for things like methane. Uh, I'm not positive. Um, it's not, we generally don't work a whole lot with mechanical equipment with these things, so I'm not positive what the best option is, but there are meters available if you look into it. How can you determine H2S in atmosphere near aeration chamber? There are lots of H2S meters available. Uh, and that's because H2S is a major safety concern. Uh, if you have a fairly, you don't need a very high concentration of hydrogen sulfide in the air, which can actually be a fatal concentration. So H2S meters are pretty widely available. And uh, I would say that would be the best bet. Get yourself an H2S detector uh, and that'll help keep you safe if you're near your plant. And they also have value uh, options for monitoring H2S in the digester. A lot of the time, if you have very high H2S, you need something with a gas scrubber to clean out the gas for combustion. So that can be kind of a pain. Dissolved, okay. So I have another question about dissolved gases in sludge effluent. So I haven't run this type of measurement, but that's an interesting question. My guess would be what you would do is you take a large liquid sample and you heat it up a little bit, which allows you to collect the gases and run it in a GC. Um, there probably are other better methods for this, but that would be my first impression. Uh, I have another question about bioabsorbent and heavy metal removal from wastewater. Can this bioabsorbent be used as a feed? Uh, 
a feed and anaerobic digestion? That is a good question. You'll have to send me the literature to this biosorbent. I don't know if it provides much in the way of feed. I have, you know, regularly heard of different metals for binding trace elements in anaerobic digestion. A lot of them use chelation and things like that, but there are some surface interactions which might work as well to lower the concentrations of metals if you have inhibition. All right, let's go back to the top. A few more questions. All right, have you experienced uh, calcium deficiency in digester that is causing dewatering performance issues? You know, I haven't experienced that, but that is a very likely thing to take place because calcium will help to condense and compact your solids better generally if you have lower calcium content, particularly if you have low calcium content relative to sodium content. Your solids will not compact as well, and therefore your dewatering will naturally be worse. But you know, I haven't talked to somebody who has had that exact problem in an anaerobic digester. My problems I've seen with calcium deficiency have been mostly confined to you. UASBs. Uh, we do see this in aerobic systems a lot. Just to draw attention to that if you are interested, if you have an aerobic system with these problems. All right, final question from a Sam. Can you discuss strategies for troubleshooting pore settling in a secondary digester holding tank to allow for dewatering? Ours currently takes weeks to months to get to the point of being able to decant the supernatant. This is not an activated sludge plant. Okay, so um, feel free to clarify uh, if you have a comment on this to make sure I understand properly. But basically, I'll go back to... All right, basically, uh, dewatering in a digester, the key things would be how much biopolymer is being produced. Generally, if you have a macronutrient deficiency, it can influence your biopolymer concentration, which might influence the dewaterability of the sludge. Um, Filaments are unlikely to be an issue. Um, if you're interested in having it looked at microscopically, you can help to give you a little bit of a better sense. But again, usually not the case. I would say you may actually have a benefit of looking into calcium levels in your sludge, <laughs> like related to the other previous question. Um, because if you have higher calcium levels in the sludge, uh, you are more likely to have good dewatering performance. But, you know, that might be something, if you're interested in having a longer conversation about it so I can look into it more, uh, shoot us an email. Uh, you can actually, anybody here can reach me at dan.s at teamaquafix.com if you have a question about your anaerobic digesters. And if I have a little bit more time, I might be able to provide you a little more complete answer there. Uh, we have another question, which is, if we add calcium, should we add calcium before digester or after digester and before dewatering? Um, I would add it before the digester. Then you'll get it to flow in. It can interact when the substrates are being digested, and it might help for a little better solids compaction. You could um, just make sure it gets there. You don't want to have the calcium building up somewhere else in your system. Um, you could add it before dewatering, but it might not have enough time to reach its full value there. All right. Um, are there any other questions? Last quest uh, shout out for questions. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining me today. I hope this presentation was helpful. And if you have any questions, reach out uh, to us and let us know. Thank you. Have a nice rest of your day.